Welcome back to the, the afternoon session. Our first speaker will be Matteo Bagioli, and uh, he will talk about the growing pains of uh, holography. Mm -hmm. uh, holography will work in space time symmetries and its transition into adulthood. <laughs> All right, so thanks a lot for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to speak here in this occasion. Um, so uh, I thought that because of the 25 years old of holography, it would be nice to give you an overview of what has been done uh, in the field, at least in a sub-sub field. And uh, that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, so in these days, uh, we've already seen that uh, holography uh, has now emerged as a very rich platform, uh, connecting uh, many different directions, many different fields. Uh, and uh, well, that's at least, in my opinion, one of the most exciting things here. And uh, so today, I'm going to present to you uh, an overview of one of these roads, one of these directions, uh, which uh, relates to the application of the ADSFT correspondence to condensed matter, and which, accordingly to the American Physical Society, has become like a full-time job. Uh, so we need to take it seriously. And uh, uh, in view of time, uh, I will not cover, of course, all the applications uh, in condensed matter. That would be impossible in 40 minutes. So I will focus on something that I'm more familiar with, uh, which is the role of breaking space-time symmetries, and in particular, translational symmetry. So a little disclaimer, I will try to give an overview and an historical perspective. This is a personal one, uh, so it's biased. And also, uh, I apologize already for the references which are not included here. Uh, of course, it's impossible to cite all of them. And in the doubt, I, die, I cite my one. So let me start with some uh, little history. Uh, so we, we all know that in 1998, one uh, discovered this beautiful correspondence between gravity and quantum field theory. Uh, but it took almost 10 years uh, to realize that this application, uh, this could be a good application also to some low energy physics, uh, and in particular condensed matter systems. And at least to my knowledge, uh, it's around 2008 that this became a real subject. Uh, and uh, uh, we've, you know, uh, for example, this famous lecture by Sean Arnold at CERN. And then in the context of breaking translation, uh, people slowly realized that there was a necessity. And uh, to my understanding, the first model that broke translation spontaneously in this contest is this paper by Oguri and collaborator. Uh, and then there is a series of paper, but really the, 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 you know, the, the golden area of this uh, uh, breaking translation, uh, it's about, let's say, between 2013 and 2022 with many authors, some of them even in the audience. And, uh, well, if you're interested, we try to summarize as much as we could in this review. And, uh, and now we're here. So now we're here, 25 years old, we are grown up, and it's about time to ask ourselves what we're going to do with our future and what we're going to do with holography for Condensed Matter. And that's what I want to discuss with you today. So let me start uh, from the original motivation for those of you who didn't work or are not working in, in this field. So the original motivation came, of course, from condensed matter, uh, but most precisely from a subclass of materials which are known as strange metal and that exhibit ITC superconductivity. And the reason why uh, it started like this is because this material, this is a picture of one of them, it looks like pretty innocuous, but unfortunately, uh, it doesn't follow the standard paradigm uh, of condensed matter, and it exhibits a, a huge plethora of uh, phenomena which cannot be explained with, let's say, the standard paradigm. And to summarize, basically, in a nutshell, the reason why is that uh, the, let's say, the dynamics and the transport, uh, it's dominated by things which are not quasi-particles. Uh, so we have basically to get rid of the idea of the electron moving along and transport heat or charge, and we have to think about some more collective behavior, which of course resonates very well with, for example, what we heard from the SYK model. So the key here is that the absence of quasi-particles, and that's why people started to think uh, about uh, how we can use holography or conformal field theory or reflective description to address these things. So among the various phenomena, of course, there is the very high critical temperature, uh, which cannot be explained by the standard BCS theory for superconductivity. There is a very famous linear interresistivity, which, again, uh, it's not explainable with Fermi liquid theory. And then a bunch of other stuff, including this famous Planckian relaxation, uh, which leads us to say that you know, thermalization is very fast. And maybe this, the dynamics in these systems is related to the same thing that we see in quark gluon plasma, where you know, this, relaxation, this thermalization is extremely fast. Now, if you think about condensed matter systems in general, uh, 
what you will see in the pictures is something like that. So you can be less or more fancy, and, but you see that all these systems have clearly one thing in common. And the thing is in common is that translational symmetry and eventually rotations, it's broken. Okay? And uh, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that if I go back to holography around fifth grade, so around 2008, uh, that's how my holographic model looked like. Okay, and I don't need to convince you that you know there are big differences. And uh, therefore, the, the, the question is like, well, first of all, what are the differences, and how we can basically patch this holographic picture to discuss Kunesmar materials? Now, when I mean uh, translational invariance is broken, uh, we have to be careful because there is a big zoo of classifications of how this is broken and uh, how this is reflected in the properties of the materials. So there is let's say, the most simple breaking, which is what I will call explicit breaking, and that's what happened in the standard uh, transport uh, picture of the Drude model. So here you have basically the blue balls are just the electrons moving. They are bouncing against these atoms, these ions, which are very heavy. And of course, these ions, since very heavy, they act as an external potential that breaks translation for these electrons. This is what I will mention as explicit breaking, and that's what gives rise basically to the finite conductivity of a material, the famous through the peak or through the rate. Now, there is another feature, which is what I will call spontaneous breaking, uh, which is nothing else than the fact that these materials are actually solids. So, differently from liquid, uh, solids are breaking spontaneously translational symmetry because the atoms want to sit at preferred position. And the way to visualize this is what is called the percorrelation function, which is this, this plot here. So you see, uh, this percorrelation function is basically telling you the probability of giving a, a particle or an atom here, what is the probability of finding another atom around in a sphere. And what you see here is that the blue picture is the, is the solid, and this function is highly picked in a periodic manner, and this is just a visualization of what we call long-range order which is a synonym of spontaneous breaking of translation. Now, on the contrary, you see that in the liquid or in the gas, this does not happen. There are no correlations. The gas is completely flat. So the particles are free, and it's completely an homogeneous state where there's no long-range order, translations are not broken. And this, in principle, is also a breaking of translation, but it's slightly different from the first type of breaking of translation. And we will understand, well, we'll discuss more how that happened. And then there is a third case, which is basically the case where you mix the two. And this is typically the case when you have some spontaneous order that forms on top of your lattice. The typical case is what is called charge density wave. So you have a system where basically the charge density wants to sit in a preferred periodic structure, which sit on top of your lattice. And then you will say, well, then I have a perfect translational symmetry, which is just that this guy can, can slide freely. But of course, that's not the case, because there are interactions, there, are, there is an harmonicity, there are frictions between these layers, and therefore, basically, this is not a perfect translational symmetry, and the would be Goldstone, that is basically these trans rigid translations, become massive. And that's what you see here. So this is basically the conductivity, and this is this massive mode, which is reflected in the transport properties of this material. Now, the plan for today is as follows. First, uh, I want to explain to you how do we make holography compatible with these broken translations. Second, I want to discuss what did we learn. Third, and very quickly, I will try to hide where did we fail. And finally, I will try to address and discuss with you actually what's next, at least in this direction. So let's start from step one. I will try to follow an historical path, uh, how things happen. And uh, so the, the step one uh, is basically how can we relax momentum and get a finer conductivity. So if you go back to the lectures of Sean Arnold in 2008, you will see this nice plot of the conductivity, which is basically this one on the top. On the, well, my left, you will see the real part of the conductivity. On my right, you will see the imaginary part of the conductivity. And you have to focus on one thing, uh, which is very important. So this is what holography could do for us in the fifth grade. And what you see is that the imaginary part has a, a pole at zero frequency. So this pole at zero frequency it's just telling you that the conductivity is actually infinite because of Kramer's chromy relation. But physically, what it's really telling you is that you are accelerating these electrons, and these electrons will go forever. And the reason why is very simple. You can go back to basically the Drude model, which is this model here of, you know, say, pinball. And what you see is that, in general, you have a time which determines basically the average scattering with these, uh, you know, these, uh, these scatterers. And these times is basically this tau here. And you can immediately see that if you send this time to infinity, meaning that the electron never scatter, 
you will find immediately that there is a pole, like one over omega in the conductivity, which is what you see here. So then what's the problem? The problem is that, well, tau in this model is infinite. The DC conductivity is infinite. The system is translational invariant, and then I cannot go to my experimental colleague and say, look, I have this amazing model. Look what I get. He will tell me, look, this is not useful. You need to put something else. So in a way, this is the representation. We are missing some piece of this, the physics behind this material. Now, what was the solution? Uh, the first solution was a very pragmatic solution and a very brute force solution. Uh, it was, well, very well. Let me take my favorite model, which is basically this uh, Maxwell-Einstein action, and let me add some scalar. And then, at the boundary, at the, I put a source for the scalar, which is just a lattice. So I just modulate this scalar, and I think that this is basically representing me my lattice. And of course, translations are broken. And this is basically what, what happens. So all the geometry, all the profiles of the gauge field, etc., becomes like periodic with a certain period. And what you find is if you redo the computation of the conductivity, you see that this infinity, it's actually cured. And it's cured, and the conductivity becomes a Drude peak. So it's finite. Even here, here is very high just because this rate is very low. But it's finite. That's the important thing. Now, what's the problem? Uh, the problem is that this is quite consuming. Okay, so you can do this, of course you can do this, and you get what you want, uh, but then it's not very clear what I, I can do more. So then, I would say that the first revolution in this direction uh, came with this nice idea by David Wegg, and, and, and David thought about symmetries. And thought, wait a second, what you want to do is just you want to break translations. So then I know from the famous dictionary that, you know, whatever... Uh, symmetry I have in the bulk, it's, you know, or it's represented somehow in the boundary, and more precisely, if I think about translation, this is nothing else than the diffeomorphic symmetry that I have in the bulk. And then he said, well, very well, then let's break it. And what is the simplest way to break diffeomorphism? Well, you just add the mass to the graviton. And to be precise, this is not just a, a general massive gravity theory, but it's a Lorentz violating massive gravity theory, because the only diffeomorphism that actually you want to break is the special one. You don't want to break the time because energy, you want to keep it conserved. So what you do is, well, very good. I take a massive gravity model. Well, David took actually the safest one, which is called DRGT massive gravity. And the reason why this is the safest, because if you go to a system which is Lorentz invariant, this is the only safe nonlinear theory of massive gravity, which has no problems in terms of cost, instability, and blah, blah, blah. And then what he did is like, okay, well, I add this mass term, and let me do the computation of the conductivity with this mass term. And surprise, surprise, he gets exactly the results that the other people get. And here you can see, again, the same thing. You see the, uh, the purple is the imaginary part, so it's not infinity anymore. And the blue is the real part, and you see there is a clear through the peak. And you can imagine that the width of this peak is basically how strong you are breaking translation, and it's related to basically how big is this mass here. Now, um, this was nice, uh, but then people after uh, realized that there is a more convenient way uh, to do that. And this is what is now called the famous axiom model. So the idea is that instead of putting a mass directly to the graviton, like by hand, which is kind of problematic, I put some scalar field. So these scalar fields are called axioms because they have a clear shift symmetry, so they are massless. And then I put a profile, which is linear in the coordinate. Okay, so th this idea at the time was not really understood, but it, it resonates a lot with the effective field theory description for solids and liquids. That's exactly what, what you do. And in this effective field theory, this scalar is nothing else than basically parametrization of the fluid or solid element. So now what you do here is that this guy here, it's a source for the scalar field, and it breaks translation, but it does it in a funny way. And the funny way is the following, that if you look at this theory, the stress sensor will always contain terms which are two derivatives in these scalars. So what this means is that you are breaking translation, but the stress sensor remains homogeneous. And this simplifies enormously your life in the sense that computation becomes very quick and very easy. And that leads to an enormous activity in terms of what are called the analytic DC conductivity, which I think you heard from Aristos and Horatio in the, in the last weeks. So the idea is that you can compute directly the transport properties of these systems just by using the membrane paradigm and looking at basically horizon data. So all these conductivities are encoded somehow in the values of the bulk fields at the horizon, where dissipation happens. And now, well, what are the advantages? The advantage is that it is very simple, it's doing the job. The disadvantage is that now you can ask yourself, what is this? 
Uh, I mean, what is, there's no real lattice. I'm breaking translation, but it's still homogeneous. And what is missing here? Is this enough to basically go and confront my condensed matter, uh, let's say, colleagues or not? Now, uh, uh, just a, a, a clarification. Uh, it, in the literature, there is this uh, uh, misunderstanding that the theory of massive gravity that I explained you before, and these axiom theories are actually different theories. Uh, that's not the reality. The reality is that these axioms are nothing else than the Stuckelberg fields for this massive gravity. So it's a way to write in, in a covariant form this massive gravity theory. And indeed, uh, this is well known in the cosmology and gravity community that you can rewrite massive gravity in terms of uh, a set of scalar fields, uh, which I call phi i here. And this action here that you see is the most generic action that you can write in, in, uh, in four dimensions. You can write it, of course, in flat, in ADS, or wherever you like. Uh, but the main point is that in, in this setup, at least in this dimension, you have only two independent objects, which are the trace of this kinetic term and the determinant. And with that, you can compute, basically, you can construct the most generic Lorentz violating theory of massive gravity. Okay, and then the example, which are this linear axiom theory and this DRGT, are just particular choices of this potential here. Okay, so this is just technical clarification, but I think it's important. Now, to be fair, uh, there are many, many other models that then appear in the literature. Uh, here I mentioned the most famous one. Uh, so there are models that exploit a global helical symmetries. These are called helical lattices. There are models, on the contrary, that are called Q lattices that instead of exploiting a global sheet symmetry, they have a global U1. And then there are other models which are more complicated and more recent, related to higher forms and whatever. Uh, but the message that I want to, to, to tell you is that if you are interested only in the IR physics, and at least for the sake of these talks, I will be, all these models are completely equivalent. And the reason is very simple, is because the symmetry breaking pattern is the same. So on the rest of the talk, I will actually focus on the IR physics, and I will try to extrapolate whatever universal uh, features or lesson we can from these models. Any questions so far? No. Then one clarification I want also to do is, what are these homogeneous models? What are we actually doing? And in particular, what is the relation with the first proposal by Orovitz and friend of putting an explicit lattice? And the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you look at this table, this table at this scale is definitely homogeneous. But if you zoom in, this table is obviously not homogeneous. There would be a lattice. So what actually these homogeneous models are doing are taking a low energy effective description, which can be understood like the description of this model at scales which is much larger than the lattice spacing. And indeed, this gentleman proved it explicitly that if you start from a model with this scalar which is modulated, and you take this approximation, you end up effectively with a theory of massive gravity where this massive the, this mass here depends on the original parameter of this lattice. Now, we are happy. We know uh, at least 10 models how to break translation explicitly, but we are still missing quite a lot of physics. The first thing that we are missing, which is very important, is that these systems are solid. So these systems have elasticity, and they have phonons, which propagates. This is just this sound that you hear here. This is your phonons. And eventually, if you are interested in these cuprates or this fancy material, you have a plethora of additional order in the phase diagram, which also break translation spontaneously. So then the question is, how can we add this future to the models? And again, uh, the first realization, it's very old, and it's the idea that if you take some specific black holes, uh, these black holes display an instability at finite wave vector. So what this means is that if you go at low temperature or low enough temperature, uh, basically you have a mode which was imaginary part becomes positive and wants to explode. And this happens at a specific wave vector that will define you basically the periodicity or the modulation of the solution in which you jump. So this is a well-known framework. This is in general goes under the name of holographic charge density wave. And there are a lot of follow-ups and a lot of different models. Uh, but again, um, this is complicated because you have to solve inhomogeneous Einstein equation. And then the idea uh, that we had after is like, well, can we again get rid of these periodicities or of these explicit lattice and just think about symmetry? We need an operator which condenses and which basically breaks translation. That's all we need. So that's what we did. And then what you see here is that if I compute the spectrum of my dual field theory, I see immediately that I have emerging like sound-like modes. So these are modes that propagate linearly with the wave vector with a certain attenuation constant. And these are the phonons. And the way we realize that these are the phonons is because if you check the speed of this excitation, is exactly given 
by the shear modulus g, which is what you will find, for example, in Landau book. Okay, so there is a, a, a big connection between the elastic properties of a material and the propagation of sound, and that's what we can recover with these models. So this is all nice. Now we know uh, how to do that. And again, there are many models, many names, so no names, uh, but uh, you can find all this reference, in the, for example, in the review, if you're interested. Now, here comes the first lessons. Okay, so now we have these models. Let's see what we can learn about it. So the first thing that we learn uh, is the following. So you can think about an hydrodynamic description of these systems, uh, which is based on symmetry and uh, on pure effective theory, and uh, which, if you want, you can call it hydrodynamics, uh, even though you know hydrodynamics of a solid sounds a bit odd, but that's what it is, at least in this, in this nomenclature. And uh, a reference, at least for holographies, meaning that it's, it's written in a language which is closer to us, is, is this one up here. And uh, the first problem that, that we found is that then we, we compared the results given from this field theory with the result from holography. And how you, ca you can see here in the left, well, they don't work very well. So there is a problem. And then we were like, well, maybe it's the holographic model that has a problem, maybe there is some non-physical feature in the holographic model, or maybe this effective field theory misses something. And that turns out to be the case. Now, the effective field theory was later uh, generalized, and it was basically pinpoint which pieces of this effective field theory was missing, and this gentleman here uh, brought us for us a more generic uh, description of viscoelastic systems, and as you can see, it matched perfectly with the holographic results. Okay, and to be fair, uh, I suspect this is not the first time that holography helped to identify some missing pieces in the hydrodynamic description, and uh, you could ask yourself, well, uh, was holography necessary? No, holography was not necessary. If, if you pin up all the, 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 the contribution of this, holographic, of this hydrodynamic expansion, you wouldn't need holography. But unfortunately, this hydrodynamic description, when you start breaking symmetries, becomes complicated. There are a lot of subtleties, and that's where you forget terms. On the contrary, holography basically gives you everything for free, and much more than that. And that's where, at least I like to call in this sense, holography as some kind of EFT 2.0, in the sense that once you write your action and your symmetry principle, you get the right answer. Now, as I told you, there is one thing more missing before we're almost ready to you know, attack our condensed matter systems. And the one for missing is that there are many situations in, uh, in condensed matter uh, where translational symmetry is there, but it's not exact. So the, the simplest way to, to, to understand that is this kind of cartoon that I made here. So imagine that you have two lattice structures, one on top of each other. So these in condensed matter are called super lattice. And for example, now they're extremely popular for this twisted bilayer graphene that you might have heard. So you just put two graphenes and you twist it. So you have two copies of the same lattice. And if you want it, you can twist it, but it's not necessary. But the point is that once you have two copies, you have clearly one translational symmetry, which is the global one. I'm just doing this. But then you have basically a relative translation. And you will think, well, if I have a relative translation, there must be a goldstone that appear, which take care of this gapless mode. But the point is that you have interaction between this layer, you have friction, you have anharmonicities, and this is not a real symmetry. What does it mean? It means that this guy gets a mass. Okay, and he gets a mass exactly in the same way like pions do get a mass in, uh, in QCD, right? So chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously by the condensate, but the, the quarks are massive, and that's what gives the mass. So in this way, you can think about the excitation of this uh, let's say, uh, translations as some kind of pseudo goldstone, and that's what they are. Now, to make like, to, to put this in a contest, uh, the place, the easiest place where you can find this kind of physics at work is the physics of charge density wave. And in this contest, the mass of the pion is what we call the pinning frequency. In the sense that disorder or impurities can pin this lattice and then this motion is not free anymore. Now, how to do that? So this is how we did it, and to be honest, we didn't realize. Uh, this is quite funny because this is my first paper in the PhD, and <laughs> at that time, uh, to be honest, we didn't understand what, what was happening here. So what you see here is that we have an holographic model, and you see the conductivities, and you see that at a certain point, at, at low temperature, you have a peak here, okay? And uh, we were trying to understand what is this peak. Uh, where does it come from? So we are breaking just translation here, so where does this peak come from? And then after, so at the time we didn't realize, but 
Afterwards, we realize that this guy here is nothing else than the manifestation on transport of this Goldstone mode that gets pinned and become massive. So what happens is that the energy at which you see this peak is basically the mass of your pion, and that I call here omega naught. And then, of course, this guy, it's also not protected by any symmetry, and therefore it gets a relaxation rate, which is wave vector independent, which I call capital omega. And that's basically how we realize, you know, this pseudo-spontaneous breaking of translation. And, and, of course, you know, it took us almost three years to understand what we were doing, but that's life, now we understand it. That's our pseudo -golsum. And then we went back. So we went back, and from holography, now we said, okay, well, very good, we have this holographic model, can we go back to the field theory perspective and trying to learn how to describe these systems? Now, let's recapitulate. So what we want to do in the most general framework is we want to include momentum relaxation, which is this explicit breaking of translation. But then we want to include also the fact that there is a pinning frequency, which is the fact that, in general, there could be a goldstone that gets pinned. And finally, because this goldstone is not protected, you expect also what is called goldstone or phase relaxation. Now, let me be more explicit in terms of formula to, to set the stage. So what you see here on the top is the free energy. So if you forget about the last term, these two terms in the free energy are nothing else than linear elasticity theory. Okay, where phi, you can think about phi as the displacement of the atoms. Okay, so these coefficients in front are nothing else than the elastic moduli. This is the shear modulus, and this is, you see, this is a transverse direction, it's like a shear, no change in volume. And this is a change in volume, so this is just a compression. And that's why in front you have basically this bulk modulus plus shear modulus. Now, if you break the symmetry also explicitly a bit, then you add a mass term. And then you see, clearly see that this is not a Goldstone anymore because it's not shift symmetric anymore. And that's one feature. The second feature is that if you look at the conservation of momentum, which is this expression here, I wrote it in non-relativistic form because this is, you know, Conan Smare. Here, first, you will add these terms, which is the relaxation rate of momentum. This is just through the physics. But then you will also add another term, which is related to the pseudo Goldstone, because the Goldstone is charged under translation and therefore contribute to this word identity, if you like. And finally, if you go up, you, you will also realize that you can put a term that tells you that the time derivative of this phase is actually not conserved. So basically, this guy can relax. Now, where physically uh, these things come from? Physically, these things come from, well, momentum relaxation, I already explained you, it's just collision, if you want, uh, and that's simple. Now, number two is expected when you have a, a combination of spontaneous and explicit breaking. This is, for example, pi in physics. Number three is more subtle. So number three is usually expected from topological defects. So if you have topological defects, these topological defects can destroy the long-range order, and therefore the phase of the Goldstone is not de well-defined anymore, and the Goldstone will relax. Now, what is the caveat here? The caveat uh, is that we see in the holographic model this capital omega, which looks like phase relaxation, but we don't have any topological defects. Absolutely zero topological defects in the model. The phase is a single value function. There's no singularity, nothing weird. So where this capital omega coming from? Now, also to convince yourself that this is not the standard phase relaxation that you see around, uh, you can do another exercise. So if you trust hydrodynamics, and you believe that this phase is relaxed, you will find that the frequency-dependent viscosity, which is defined by this Kubo formula, get through the peak as well. So you are going to relax, basically, the frequency-dependent viscosity. And if you compute, this is what you get from, say, the topological defects, the description. Now, you do the same exercise from holography. We know how to compute this correlator. It's the famous correlator that gives it over s. We compute it at final frequency, and we see there is a big pole. So, what is happening? We see capital omega in somewhere, but then it doesn't enter in the same way as it should. So is the capital omega the same of these topological defects? Is something different? What's going on? So the, the, the big discovery, if you want, is that not only this capital omega is something different, but it's something extremely universal that is related to the physics of pseudo Goldstone mode. So what is the idea? The idea, and this is the finding of these papers, uh, is the following. So, I guess most of you are familiar with this gelman ox renner relation, which tells you that the mass of the pions follow a very strict rule, which is basically the consequence that the pion remembers that it's a Goldstone mode. 
Now, this relation is universal and it is found also in this holographic model for the mass, but there is another relation which is universal, which is that this relaxation time for this pseudo Goldstone mode, it's not random. And it's even worse than that, it's not an independent transport coefficient. So, what we saw in this model, and this was the first observation, is that basically uh, this, sorry, let's look at this formula, this relaxation rate is exactly proportional to what you will call the mass times a function which is a property only of the spontaneous state. So all the information here about the fact that you are breaking explicitly the symmetry are contained you know, in capital omega are contained in the pinning frequency. And then you can see that you would believe that this is a new coefficient, but it's not. So in a way, I like to think about this as the GOM relation for the dissipative part of the dispersion relation. Now, this was where it was found, and it was found first in this holographic model by uh, collaborators. And you can see that it saturates at low, a low value of the explicit breaking. So one clarification, this is only valid when the breaking is pseudo-spontaneous. So you need still to have a notion of the pseudo goldstone If you destroy the symmetry completely, of course, the pseudo goldstone is gone. So this is the reason why, for example, you know, the pions is the pseudo goldstone because the mass of the quarks are small. If you make the mass of the quarks enormous, you lose the symmetry and you cannot talk anymore about any pseudo goldstone. That's the same. So here, this parameter lambda in this plot, it's what governs the quark mass, if you like. And you see that if I make it small, then I find that this ratio is fully universal and it always goes to one. Now, is this an accident? Is this a prediction of holography? What is this? So, well, the first thing that you would like to do is you would like to check it in at least a couple of models because before you go out and you say, hey, I discover a new universal relations. And that's what people did. So here, I just copy pasted plot from various references where you see that in all these models, these are different models, and you see that always this universal relation is there. Okay? So then you become a bit more suspicious and you're like, well, maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe there is something more profound here. And the funny thing is that a few years after, it was realized in a totally different contest by QCD people in the context of pions. So then you go to QCD, you see this, this, uh, this paper by Tinian collaborator, and what they do there is basically they study the dynamics of pions in this O4 model. So they simplify a bit QCD, they go to SU2 times SU2, and they study basically the dynamics of this pion. And here there is a nice comment, they say that, you see, they have two independent uh, coefficients, but actually they find out that they must have the same dissipative coefficient. And they say, this is interesting, they say that these arise from entropy considerations. So it looks like that they found the same thing in a totally different context, and they give a reason which you see has nothing to do with holography. It's a more profound reason. It looks there is some more profound physics behind. And then, of course, the first thing that you would like to do, you know, if, you, if you're good with holography, you're okay, okay, let's check. Is this true? So we can make a model. This model is just, you know, a standard ADS QCD model, SU2 times SU2, and we check that. And indeed, what you find here is that the, if the mass of the quark is small enough, you find that this ratio is exactly one. So, well, uh, then the idea is that is this a property of a specific symmetry or if it's a generic property of a pseudo spontaneous breaking of a symmetry? We check for translations. This gentleman find out for chiral symmetry. Can we check that this is valid for other symmetries? So then what we did is like, wait, wait a second. We, we start from the difficult job. We start from translation. Why we don't consider a global U1 symmetry and break it spontaneously and then explicitly? Then, of course, you could ask yourself, well, this is not really physical. I don't know any system that does something like that. Well, maybe you can think about the axial charge in QCD, but that's not really the point. Here, it's basically as a toy model to try to see if this happens or not. And what we found out is that basically this happens as well. So you can see these are basically the Goldstone mode that increasing the, basically the explicit breaking becomes massive and goes around in the complex plane. And here again, you see we check this for many different realizations, and you always see that this ratio goes to one. So then what do we discover? We discover that this thing is not an artifact of holography, and this thing is not a specific property of translation symmetry or whatever. So it looks there is something more here. And uh, well, then after that, we almost convince people that maybe it's worth to check with some other techniques. And just immediately, uh, well, you can see here there are at least four papers with four different proof of these which have nothing to do with holography. So all these papers use either effective field theory techniques, Keldish-Finger field theory, or hydrodynamics techniques to derive this relation. Now, funny enough, uh, some of them 
uh, agrees on what's the, the reason, the underlying reason, some less. So the first paper that, to my understanding, proved this relation from things which are not holography is this paper by Tini, where it's clearly, uh, this relation comes clearly from the positivity of entropy production in the hydrodynamic framework. Then we kind of try to do this with the Keldyshwinger formalism, and it came out automatic. So we were like, oh, wow, that's easy. Then people after try to claim that this comes from locality, or whatever that means in hydrodynamics. And then again, other people made a more general analysis related to the first paper, and they consider very different symmetry pattern breaking, and they found that, again, entropy production positivity is enough to basically derive this. So then here, well, I want to stop and I want to say, well, you know, many times uh, when you give these talks, especially in front of Conan Smarter people, they ask you, well, what is the prediction? Can you, make, can you give me a prediction of string theory? Or is holography like, a, did you learn something more than what we learned before in Conan Smarter or whatever in holography? Well, I think this is one case. This is one case. Again, as you see, I'm not saying that holography was necessary, but holography was definitely the key to arrive to this answer. So in this way, Definitely, there is a merit to this, this investigation. Now, we talk about a lot of, about these uh, universal relations, but I want to tell you one possible, uh, let's say, um, key point where this relation can be at work and can explain something in condensed matter. So the original argument can be found in this paper. I'm going to sketch it for you very quickly. So let's start from the experiments, because we are physicists, so we look at the experiments. So, this is the resistivity of a cuprate, one of these fancy strange metals, as a function of temperature. Now, the gap that you see here is simply because this material becomes superconductor. Okay, so forget about the gap. Now, if you see in the intermediate re regime, you see that there is a clear linear regime. And this linear regime, why is striking? Because it's, first of all, it extends a lot. And second, it extends to very low temperature. So this, for example, for the condensed matter people, has nothing to do with the electron phonon scattering at high temperature. So electron phonon scattering at high temperature, where the phonons are classic, gives also linearity. That's not what we're talking about here. So the phonons here are definitely not classic, and that mechanism cannot be at work. Now here, what is the interesting thing? These people took this material, and they start to irradiate it. When you irradiate it, you basically make it dirty. So the material becomes more disordered. You create puddles of disorder and impurities around. And therefore, what you see? You see that the resistivity goes up. That makes sense, right? The electrons bump more, this thing is dirty, you are moving, and you go slower. Now, there are two features, though, which are important. The resistivity goes down, so there is a residual resistivity, which is temperature independence, which just is shifting these things up. But look at the slope. The slope seems like it's not changing at all. So how do we explain that? Well, if you believe uh, this, this, what I told you before, and you do the computation from hydrodynamics, you will find that the resistivity of this metal in the Galilean limit looks like that. So there is a first term, which is what you will call the Drude rate, which is highly sensitive to disorder. But then there is a second term that looks like that. Now, if you apply this universal relation that we just discussed, these terms here can be rewritten like this, where this is the speed of sound, and this is the diffusion constant. Now, if you add a bit of faith, and you believe the proposal by Arnold that these diffusivities are set by Planckian time, then you input this input on the right. So you are just saying that, of course, the diffusivity by dimensional analysis is velocity squared times a time. And then you say, well, let's assume that this time is Planckian, the fastest time possible that you can motivate with, dif for, with different reasons. Well, then you plug it back, and you get this formula. Now, this formula is quite intriguing, because you see, there is a term, which is linear in T, whose coefficient is completely, let's say, at least a leading order, insensitive to this disorder. And then there is a second term, which is like residual, that you can think like this shift. So then, well, this is one case where maybe, you know, what we learn from holography not only is a new thing in terms of effective field theory or, you know, hydrodynamics, but can actually be the key behind understanding some real properties in some real material. And I'm almost done, uh, so I want to ask uh, us and, you know, the audience and everybody, what's next? Uh, well, I think what's next, it's pretty simple, is that if you want to do apply holography, you need to apply it. And uh, it's a hard job, uh, but that's what you, what, you, what you have to do, and that's basically, well, this is a, a funny representation from this website, 
that, by the way, I run. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, to just tell you that, you know, at a certain point, you know, you see, well, I don't know if I can say the word, but whatever yeah, is falling here, uh, it will get around, and maybe, you know, science, the umbrella of science will just leave us with the, you know, the, the good fruit. And uh, so that's the idea. Now, uh, also closing remarks, which I think it's important, which, you know, uh, I heard many times, and, uh, well, we can discuss it. Well, these are typical sentences that I heard. Uh, you know, string theory does not give any predictions. Uh, can you prove it? Holography is not proven, so what you're doing, what are you doing? Uh, you can get whatever you want. Uh, and, well, this is, these are not just, you know, cartoons. You can even find paper in archive. So it, it's not that I'm inventing these critics. Here there are a bunch of papers uh, that, you know, same guy. And you, <laughs> you can clearly see that the titles are not exactly, you know, he wants to understand the topic or make friendship. And, um, well, I mean, fair enough, uh, that's good, and the critics, you know, are, are, are there to build, not to destroy it. But I think it's fair uh, to, to summarize the status of, of this direction uh, with these things. Holography is certainly useful. And uh, holography has definitely contributed to EFT and dynamics, and uh, even when not needed, if you like. Uh, and definitely holography has prompted a new perspective in condensed matter problem and also in field theory, hydrodynamics, etc. And there are right now people in the world, condensed matter people, that are taking this seriously. Uh, so an example, I was just last week in Chalmers University in Sweden and uh, an experimental uh, scientist came to me and said, look, I have this sample. What should I measure to, to prove something or what prediction can you give me? So they're taking this seriously. And uh, to make just a, you know, a summary, well, is there a prediction, a big prediction missing? Um, well, maybe, but you know, we are just 25 years old and we are basically at the edge of thinking seriously about life. So, well, that's where we are. And uh, with, with that, I think I just say, you know, happy birthday and, uh, well, open for questions. Thank you. Actions indeed. There is a famous, I mean, way before holography, it was one of the first things that was done in quantum field, in sort of transport and quantum field theory, mm -hmm. a relation between shear viscosity and bulk viscosity. I mean, you know, I, Weinberg's cosmology gives a, a simple derivation of this, that bulk viscosity is shear viscosity times the generator of broken conformal invariance. Is this similar? in spirit to the formulas you derived in Goldstone bosons, or it's a completely different thing? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's quite different in the sense that the, the relation between the bulk viscosity and the shear viscosity, I don't see it as, you know, uh, driven or coming from any symmetry breaking or something like that. It, uh, is, it, it comes? It, it comes from symmetry breaking. Well, you mean because to have the bulk viscosity non-zero, you need to break conformal symmetry. Yeah, and the breaking... Hmm. The bulk viscosity depends on the conformal yeah. symmetry. Well, breaking. yeah, then maybe yes. I'm not aware of the details of these things, but mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting, yeah. So mm -hmm. please let me know the reference or, mm -hmm. or the sure. things. Yeah, sure, okay. That might be, yeah. Hi, uh, maybe you said this, mm -hmm. but I was wondering. Um, so it seemed to me that when you were talking about the appearance of uh, there's a pinning frequency in holographic models, it kind of came out as an accident in the first model that you wrote down. Can you, so what is the reason why in gravity that, you know, a gravitational reason why this may appear? Okay, so l let me qualify what I mean by it came by an accident. Uh, what I mean by came an accident is that we were working with a model that was breaking translations and we were trying to generalize this model. And uh, what we didn't realize is that what we were doing, we were going exactly in this pseudo-spontaneous limit. So we saw this peak in the conductivity, and uh, we thought that we were breaking translation only explicitly. So we didn't understand how, what was the reason for this peak there at a certain energy. Now, what we understand now is that what we were doing was basically exactly implementing in the gravity picture uh, the, the breaking of this translational symmetry as pseudo-spontaneous. So it's not a coincidence that what we were getting was a massive mode. Uh, it was just that at that time, uh, we didn't realize that we were actually doing it. That's, uh, that's what was happening. 
So years after we realized, and many other people realized. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. And we all go visit the website, I guess. <laughs>